Okay, so um, welcome everybody and uh, we're very happy for the last seminar of this quarter to have Mariangela Zanti from Princeton who will talk to us about the uh, Princeton co-magnetometer experiment. So uh, thanks Mariangela. Thanks Robert and uh, thank you very much for the invitation to, to join virtually. Um, it's always, especially these days, really nice to, to see everybody uh, online. A reminder of the way things were, I guess. <laughs> Um, so I, I wanted to talk today about some ongoing work with um, Mike Ramales and Will Toronto, um, as well as uh, another postdoc, June Ely, and my graduate student, Matthew Moschella. Um, I had been keeping my fingers crossed that we were going to actually have the uh, data analysis done um, by the time uh, uh, I, I gave this talk, but uh, that, that hasn't happened, um, as usually is the case when one makes optimistic projections. Um, but I will give you a, um, a general overview of what we've been up to. Um, the uh, idea is we've been um, preparing to go back into some uh, old data that uh, Mike's group uh, gathered about a decade ago um, and uh, re reanalyze it to uh, look for uh, an axion signal. Um, in order to do that properly, we've had to kind of think carefully about how to um, uh, treat uh, axion stochastic effects in the likelihood analysis. Um, so we've been building a, a pipeline to, to handle all of that. And um, that's where most of the work has gone now, um, essentially preparing that pipeline so that we can just open up the data box and, um, and then run it through. So I will um, be focusing most of my talk today on um, on the details of, of how we're, we're thinking about that statistical analysis. Um, and so I should mention that partially because I've been feeling really sad that I haven't been writing on blackboards anymore. Um, I am thought I'd, I'd sort of do this talk where I'm actually writing things out um, blackboard style. Um, also in an attempt to try to keep this informal um, uh, and, and interactive. So, so please don't hesitate to uh, interrupt me at, at any point uh, with questions or, or discussion. I'm happy to kind of go wherever you guys want to go uh, in terms of uh, interest or, or, uh, or questions. So let me just start with a very general and quick overview. I know that this is uh, um, uh, probably not needed for, for this audience, but um, uh, the focus here is going to be on axionic dark matter, so ultralight scalars. Um, the mass that we're talking about uh, is, uh, well, in general, the, the lightest mass when we restrict ourselves to bosonic dark matter um, in order to be able to get halos associated with dwarf galaxies that restrict us, restricts us to masses that are down to about 10 to the minus 22 electron volts. Um, and there's a, a whole variety of, of axion-like models that, that uh, populate this space. Um, and the phenomenology is very interesting um, because the dark matter acts like a coherent wave. Um, so the uh, most compelling examples of these ultralight particles is the QCD axion because it uh, can solve the strong CP problem and also gives us a viable dark matter candidate. Um, in the QCD axion example, we get this very tight link between the predicted mass of the axion and the scale at which uh, the symmetries are, are broken in the theory. Um, but if we relax that and we just sort of consider theories that are independent of uh, uh, QCD, then uh, we, we break this tight link between mass and symmetry breaking scale. And uh, we refer to those ultralight particles as being axion-like. Um, and those are the candidates that I'm really going to be focusing on um, in the course of uh, my talk today. Uh, now, when we refer to these uh, axion-like particles, they can have a whole variety of couplings. Um, one that has uh, certainly received a lot of attention in terms of uh, direct detection experiments is the axion coupling to photons. Um, and in this case, um, you, you have an axion coupling essentially to E dot B. And uh, that lends itself to using a lot of classical ENM techniques um, to search for uh, that particular interaction. For the purposes of my talk today, I'm going to focus on the uh, axion coupling to neutrons, 
So um, this particular vertex, the effect of Lagrangian here um, is going to depend on the derivative of uh, the axion field and then n bar gamma phi gamma mu n. And I'm going to be using g, a, and n as being the, the coupling of the axion and the neutron in this case. Um, in the non-relativistic limit, this ends up becoming uh, gradient A of the axion dotted into the spin of the, um, the nucleon. And so that's, uh, this here is essentially the coupling that, uh, and the interaction that we're going to be focusing on. So in the presence of um, an axion background, um, we can end up observing uh, its effect on um, nuclei in spin systems, and, um, and then hopefully from that uh, infer the presence of that, that axion background. Um, the coupling to, to neutrons, um, there's a variety of bounds that have already been placed on this. Um, so summarized here are just the astrophysical bounds on the space. So here's the coupling strength, uh, GANN, um, mass of the axion uh, in EV here on the bottom axis. Um, and so there's two relevant uh, constraints. This one here, which is coming from the cooling of supernova 1987A. And the basic idea here is um, we uh, observe about several dozen, uh, two dozen neutrinos uh, from supernova 1987A. And if there was a emission of axions in the core of that supernova, that would um, accelerate the energy loss and affect the properties of the neutrino burst that we would see. So um, based off of the actual observation of that neutrino burst, we can then end up placing um, constraints on what, um, how many, how many um, the coupling strength for the axion. So how, how much that the axion presence would have affected the energy loss there. And so that's the bound that you're seeing here. And then the second um, down here, uh, is coming from neutron star cooling. So the idea here is um, we just look for the hottest neutron star we can find. Um, this particular one is a, a supernova remnant um, called J1731-347. Um, it's particularly hot, so um, about two times 10 to the six Kelvin. Um, and the fact that it even exists um, allows us to exclude any processes that would have uh, cooled it too rapidly. Um, such as axion emission. So uh, again, then we can infer from the presence of that the fact that that neutron star exists, we get this um, exclusion bound here on um, this axion coupling strength. And it's important just to note, um, you know, in moving forward and keeping these in mind that um, in both the supernova and the neutron star cooling case, um, they, they involve calculating emission rates in hot plasma uh, at nuclear densities. Um, so there are systematic uncertainties, and it's a hard calculation, um, and there are uh, uncertainties associated with that that are not reflected um, in these lines here. So I'm sort of imagine some kind of spread uh, in this, uh, just coming from uh, theoretical uncertainties in that, in that calculation. There are also some laboratory-based experiments that uh, have been looking for this coupling with uh, nuclei. Um, so that's summarized here on um, this plot, and the references are being blocked by my, here we go. Um, <clears throat> so just to kind of walk you through what some of these uh, current constraints are, um, there's uh, the yellow here, which is coming from um, some of the new force experiments using torsion balances. So that's reinterpreting um, their constraints uh, in terms of the axion parameter space. Um, and then there's uh, these two Casper bounds um, here, which are coming from cone magnetometers that are using um, both carbon-13 and hydrogen. Um, <clears throat> and uh, um, yeah, so I, I just mentioned the, uh, uh, the nuclei that are being used there because just to contrast that um, in a few slides, I'll tell you a little bit about the, the Princeton cone magnetometer is using um, different nuclei at, in the target. And then um, this blue region here is coming from um, an experiment that's looking for precession in um, neutrons and uh, uh, mercury. So one thing I do wanna just uh, 
state before moving forward is that the limits as presented here are assuming that the, the axion field is um, deterministic. Um, and so it does not take into account uh, the stochastic nature of the axion field. And this I'm gonna discuss um, in a lot more detail um, in the second part of the talk. Um, but that stochastic behavior is really, uh, is um, going to be present because um, locally, what we essentially have is a super, superposition of many axion fields and um, properly accounting for those, that stochastic behavior can actually affect uh, the, the strength of the limit that, that you infer for, for the experiment. Um, so, okay, so moving forward, uh, the first part of the talk, I just wanted to review a little bit um, the setup for the Princeton co-magnetometer experiment. So this is a uh, micromolysis uh, setup. Um, then I'll talk about uh, the stochasticity uh, of axion waves, um, you know, what it is, how it ends up affecting um, any analysis that's done and how you uh, can account for it. And then in the last part, um, which will just be brief, um, I will kind of outline for you how um, uh, sort of the approach that we're gonna take in analyzing uh, the data from, from this experiment. Uh, so I should just mention um, before moving forward that uh, uh, micromolysis uh, experiment, um, which is this Princeton co-magnetometer has been mentioned in a variety of contexts. Um, and actually Maxime, um, had uh, back in 2014, already had kind of a back of the envelope calculation for um, uh, what the limit on axion should be if you reinterpreted um, the original published results from Mike's experiment um, in, into, for the axion case. And then there's been a variety of other works as well um, that have looked uh, at the implications for axions um, from this experimental result. Where our analysis is going to differ is in a variety of ways. So one is um, <clears throat> we're gonna be properly accounting for the stochasticity of the axion waves. And then the second is um, we're working directly with Mike. So we're, we're literally gonna be going into the raw data and analyzing everything in there. So if there actually is a signal, um, well, you know, we should be able to see it um, and, uh, and you know, try to you know, figure out what, what it all means. Um, so just to kind of set, set things up, um, you know, co-magnetometer is essentially an ultra-sensitive magnetic field detector. And why is this helpful when you're looking for an axion? Well, so to go back to uh, our Lagrangian uh, for our neutron interaction, axion-neutron interaction, just write that up here. Um, the corresponding Hamiltonian in the non-relativistic limit um, is as follows. So we've got the coupling, a dependence on the axion uh, mass density, uh, a cosine term that depends on the energy of the axion, and then some phase theta. And then there's velocity of the axion field dotted into um, the spin direction for that uh, neutron. Now, if you recall, uh, um, when you have a spin in a magnetic field, the Hamiltonian is proportional to B dot S. So if we look at what we have up here for the axion case, that means we can equate this piece here with essentially being some effective axion magnetic field. So it's oscillating at the energy that's set by the axion field um, <clears throat> and with some, some random phase. So any experiment that would be set up to search for any small anomalous magnetic field would then have sensitivity to potentially pick up um, a contribution from this um, effective axion magnetic field. The um, Princeton experiment is um, an al alkali noble metal uh, co-magnetometer. So it contains both potassium and helium. And I think to understand how it works, it's easier to kind of build it up um, piece by piece. So let me just start by um, considering what happens if you only had potassium in, in your magnetometer. So, um, you know, you have a cell and it's um, filled with uh, potassium atoms um, and then you pump it with a laser and that laser effectively polarizes your system 
So the spins, let's say in this case, would all point in the x hat direction. Um, now let's imagine that there's some external magnetic field that's acting on the system. And this can either be some magnetic field that we as the experimental uh, list would, would put in the system, or maybe that's our anomalous um, axion field. Um, that external magnetic field applies a torque to the spin, um, causing it to precess in the xy plane um, as follows. <clears throat> and in order to detect the precession of that, um, the spin of that uh, potassium, we then use a probe laser in this direction that uh, can detect the projection of the spin along the y direction. Um, so now if we are interested in, you know, if this external magnetic field is actually um, an anomalous magnetic field from, from the axion. Um, one important requirement is that we need the spin of the um, potassium to be able to track it. Um, so that means that the time scale on which the axion field is varying um, needs to be longer than the relaxation time of the potassium spins. Um, and by relaxation time of the spins, what I mean is the time it takes for the spin to align itself with uh, the B field. Um, if the uh, axion field is changing too rapidly, then the spin will not be able um, to align itself up and sort of track uh, what the magnetic field is doing. Um, and that's going to be um, problematic. So uh, this is one of the general requirements that we need um, that the time scale for the axion oscillation needs to be uh, longer than the relaxation time for the spins in the system. And there's a whole variety of things that will affect what that relaxation time is. Um, for example, uh, interactions between the potassiums in the system or how, um, like sort of in, in the cell, um, as well as uh, how, um, you know, the potassium interacts with the vessel walls or um, pumping by the laser, the pump laser or the probe laser. So there's a variety of things that can affect that um, relaxation time. But in any case, um, this setup here is one that you could use. Uh, Mary Angela, Mary Angela, could I ask you a question? Yeah. Sorry. Hi, is, is, hi there. I can see you. Um, um, yeah. So I'm going to ask you a sort of experimental question. So I apologize. Can, can you remind me, or say, just some of the advantages of potassium over other choices? I mean, why, why are Ramaz used this? Do you, do you, can you say? Um, so, uh, well, making the obvious statement that I have with my theorist hat on. Um, and I, I wish I were as good as Mike to be able to answer all of these questions. Um, my understanding is that potassium is a particularly good uh, option here, um, mainly just because it's it's an alkali and, and it's easy to polarize. Mm -hmm. um, now, why potassium as opposed to another alkali? That I'm not entirely sure. Does it, does it have a particularly good um, um, short relaxation time? You want a short relaxation time, correct? Uh, yes, track. yeah, and actually it, it does in, in um, yes, it, it does uh, for in, in the setup. I was going to get to that on the next slide when I start introducing the helium-3, but yeah, the uh, relaxation time is, is good. Okay, and, and this is in the gaseous phase? Uh, yeah. Yes, okay, good, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Actually, sorry, just to ask a different question. Um, I'm not quite clear on what you mean by relaxation time in this setup. Um, so, okay, so we've polarized our spins with a pump laser so that they're along the x-axis. And then we've mm -hmm. got some external B-field, which means they're processing in the x-y-plane. Um, yeah, what, 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 is, what is the relaxation time in terms of the behavior of the spins in the diagram that you've drawn? Um, so it's essentially, so if, if let's say the, the external field B is constant, right? then that's mm -hmm. going to set up a, a, essentially a constant torque that's on S, on S of K. Mm -hmm. um, and then that sets the precession frequency for S of K. Um, now imagine that to the external field B uh, changes. Um, mm -hmm. you know, maybe it's even easier to sort of think about it in, in the case where it changes direction. Um, if, so in that sort of extreme case where you know, then it might be pointing in this direction here at some later time, um, then the torque that's acting on your potassium atom <clears throat> will change 
yep. right? And you're going to want the, the potassium atom to then be responding to that and, and start precessing in the new plane in which it should be precessing, right? It essentially but it does, it does, but it does that the... Sorry, but spins do that instantaneously. They don't have it. They don't, sorry, um, can you, um, sorry, it's just a, a bit of noise here. I need to, I need to go away. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm a bit confused because spins respond instantaneously to torques. They don't have inertia. So, um, What's the uh, what's stopping them doing that? Um, spins respond. Oh. As in, they're, they're going to start sort of move their. Sorry, move. I'm just trying to think of the right way to. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so you, you want the whole, I mean, you, like you want your whole like spin system to then end up being tracking to, sorry, to track where um, uh, the new B field is um, is pointing to. So, um, I mean, there's, there's a certain time that in which it, uh, this relaxation time is essentially describing uh, uh, how long it takes for the system to sort of align itself in in that direction okay so, so we're looking if, at some, if you had a single if you had a single spin would this be zero like is this due to some sort of interaction between nearby spins in your gas or, or? ah um yes yeah yeah it's it's a very complicated sort of coupled system so actually when you write down and this is obviously very cartoony um, but when you write down the full, um, like if you write down the full expression for like uh, how ds of k like changes with time, um, it depends on sort of a variety of things that are coming from the fact that um, you know there's interactions between the potassium atoms, um, how the potassium ends up feeling forces from the B field. In the case where you add helium three, there's also going to be a um, a relationship with uh, um, it feeling and responding to what's happening to the helium three in the system. So it's actually sort of, there's a lot of things that are going on in, in, a, in affecting how, um, in setting that, that time dependence for DS of K BT. It's, it's a complicated coupled system. Yeah, so the confusing aspect is usually uh, sort of dissipation and relaxation are bad things. You want your relaxation time to be as long as possible. But here, I guess you're setting it up so that uh, you're looking at it once it's actually relaxed there's some dissipative process that you want to have happened fast. Is that the idea? Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe another way of saying it is you want the, um, you want the magnetic field to be like the process to be adiabatic. Um, so you just, you just wanna make sure that your B field is not changing so rapidly that your S of K can't follow it. So any, the changes that we're talking about here to the B field need to be adiabatic. Thanks. Um, are there any other questions while I've sort of paused here? Um, okay, so if, if not, then um, I'll add the additional complication to this, uh, which is uh, helium-3. And the reason that um, we're going to be interested in adding helium-3, at least for the axion case, is um, if the axion only couples to a nucleon, then um, uh, it will not be coupling to uh, the polarized uh, electron spin in the alkali, um, but it will couple to a polarized uh, helium-3 neutron spin. Um, so, so in this, the way this is going to be set up is we again have our um, potassium here and we polarize it. So it's spin again is going to point along X. So we pump this system. <clears throat> and the spin of the potassium is coupled with uh, the helium three that's also in the vessel. Um, so when you polarize the potassium, it ends up polarizing the helium three. Um, and it's not going to be exact. So that's when we kind of draw this at a slight tilt here. But um, 
you end up getting a polarization of your, your nuclei, um, your helium-3 nucleon, nucleon spins. So, um, so now this is good. You have two separate um, uh, pieces here, the potassium and the helium-3, and they're both uh, polarized. Um, they then end up essentially um, putting an, a magnetic field on their partner. So the polarized helium um, creates a magnetic field that is felt by the alkali, potassium, and the polarized potassium um, creates a magnetic field that is felt by the helium. Um, and so each of those magnetic fields ends up causing the uh, respective um, components here to, to precess um, in the presence of just those two magnetic fields. Um, just, just to ask. Now, this is where we come back to our, yes. Is, is there a reason why you've drawn these things along the z-axis, even though the spins are pointing along the x-axis? Uh, yeah, for simplicity of drawing my, uh, for simplicity of, little, of drawing my little circles here. Okay. So I'm assuming that there's a component that is in the Z direction. Okay, so some misalignment. Yeah. Right, that's, right, right. Um, yeah, perhaps I should have drawn my S of K slightly off the X axis. Okay, sure. Yeah, uh, thank you uh, for keeping my diagrams honest. Um, so in this kind of system here where they're only reacting to the uh, magnetic fields that are created by their partner, um, we end up hitting a, an issue because the relaxation time for the helium-3 spin is about a few hours. Um, but the axion period that we're going to be interested in is more on the order of a second. So the axion field will be um, uh, oscillating at a much faster, uh, much faster period, um, then the helium-3 can actually respond to it. Um, so that's problematic. So in this system, just as I've drawn it, the helium-3 would actually not be able to respond and pick up the axion uh, wave. Um, so in order to uh, tune the system to be able to do that, um, what you do is you get it to what's called um, a compensation point. And this compensation point uh, occurs, oops, uh, when you add in, when you can essentially reduce the um, magnetic field that is felt by the potassium. So you add in, um, the experimentalist will add in some external B field that, um, essentially cancels out um, the B helium. And both here will feel the effects of that magnetic field. But the net result is that the effective magnetic field that's felt by the potassium is gonna be much, much smaller than it was uh, originally. Um, and also what ends up happening is that the helium three and the, the potassium become tightly coupled to each other. Um, so in this configuration, which is called a compensation point, you have this tight coupling between the two components in the co-magnetometer. And the uh, relevant thing that happens is that the relaxation time in the helium-3 goes down to being more on the order of 100 milliseconds. So in this particular regime, then um, the helium-3 actually can respond to the presence of an axion um, if that axion were there. So um, just to kind of be very explicit about it in this configuration, if uh, we had some additional axion field that's here, and let's say that axion is only coupled to the, the nucleons, then that axion field would end up affecting the precession of the helium-3. Because the helium-3 is coupled to the potassium, that would in turn end up affecting the precession of the potassium spin and then we would pick that up um, by applying a probe laser that tracks the change in the potassium spin. Um, and again, in this configuration at this particular compensation point, uh, the relaxation time for the helium-3 is small enough that it can track the uh, changes um, to the axion field. So, so 
I'm I'm not sure I completely understand the picture. Um, first of all, the, the of course the magnetic field that the potassium and the helium feels, both of them feel actually like the total magnetic field, B helium plus B potassium. It's not like the it's not like the helium atoms only feel the magnetic field from the potassium. So, so when you cancel this out for the potassium, why do you not also cancel this out for the helium? Uh, you do, you do. Um, so, so yeah, you, you, the external field that you apply, so you're right, um, you're, um, if that's not being captured by my little, my simple cartoon, but, um, <clears throat> uh, but you're correct. Um, and the external field that you're applying is the same external field to both the potassium as well as the helium. The key thing, though, is that the, ex the actual magnitude of that external field is being set by, um, uh, you essentially are tuning it to essentially um, have the potassium feel uh, essentially a zero field um, you're wanting to try to get at. So, so can I think of this as working in the following way? Um, the, the relaxation time is in some way long because I have a big mean field that's sitting around from all the other potassium and helium uh, helium atoms. And, uh, and this means that like the comparative magnetic field coming from the axion is just very small. It doesn't, you know, like the, it takes a very long time for the axion effect to dominate because there's some just mean field that's sitting around from all the other ions. And so if I actually want to measure this small uh, axion magnetic field, I need to cancel the mean field. Like that's essentially what this compensation point is doing. Or, or is there something uh, more? Yes, yeah, you can also think of it that way because the um, when you're in the compensation point, you've essentially canceled out the largest effects of the uh, magnetic fields that are caused by the polarization. So the system is kind of in its own zero field, zero magnetic field. Um, configuration. So it becomes that much more sensitive to any smaller like external anomalous field that might be there, um, say from the axion. Okay. Yeah, but thank you. That makes sense. Um, great. So um, the uh, Romalis group at Princeton used this potassium um, helium co-magnetometer to set constraints on unparticles and spontaneous breaking of Lorentz symmetry um, back in, and their paper on this was back in 2008. So all the data um, was, was collected um, and this is actually the noise spectrum from uh, their published paper um, from more than a decade ago. Um, and uh, based off of this noise spectrum, you can actually just estimate um, what the sensitivity should be, um, just kind of back of the envelope estimate on the axion. So um, the sensitivity to any kind of anomalous field is on the order of about a femtotesla. Um, and that corresponds to a coupling of the axion nucleon um, of roughly 10 to the minus 10 inverse GeV. <clears throat> uh, and, you know, obviously the downside to the fact that we're going to be working with data that's already been collected over a decade ago is essentially we're at the mercy of whatever is there. Um, and you can see some of that from this um, picture here. So, for example, this peak here um, where the noise bumps up, that's coming from uh, some cooling system in the lab. Um, these ones here have to do with some mechanical resonances in the optical table um, and so on. Um, but it's not like we can go back in and then like turn off the cooling system and then get more data so that we can, you know, decrease the noise in this particular region. We're just kind of subject to, uh, to whatever's there. Um, that being said, the level of sensitivity in terms of the, the noise level, especially right here, so in the range of axion masses around 10 to the minus 15, 10 to the minus 14 EV, um, is extremely good. And so that, um, this it here is what essentially um, uh, allows us to project that we think the, the expected sensitivity of what we'll be able to get is going to fall roughly in this regime here. So below the astrophysical bounds from um, supernova 1987A and from neutron star 
uh, cooling. Um, so this is uh, this is just you know an estimate back of the envelope estimate, but um, you know everything we're going to be doing is going to be to try to get that sensitivity as good as possible in that regime. Sorry, but, um, but so the noise is lower at like ten to the minus twelve. Is that are you just focusing on this band because the signal is also worse at these higher masses? So above like ten uh, to the minus thirteen eV, the noise kind of is dropping pretty rapidly. Uh, that's right. Yeah. So the um, the the noise level goes down, but your overall sensitivity to the axion field is not going to be improving. Um, is not going to be improving there, as you, as you said. Oh. Can I ask one? Yes. Yeah. Is there a reason why the noise level goes down so much after like fifty hertz? Oh gosh, um, I'm actually not sure. I wish Will was here. He could probably answer your question very, very easily. <laughs> I think it's just a pretty standard power law acoustic noise spectrum. Okay. Why, why would it kick in right there? So I know that this peak here is coming from the resonance of the coupled spin ensemble. So then why would that particular noise spectrum like just come in here? Oh no, I don't I don't know what this is being caused by. I'm just saying that at some point it'll turn over into a power law and presumably we're seeing once it's turned over into a power law. That that wasn't a very contentful comment. Oh I see. Okay. Yeah. No, where it does is uh, like that's for the experimentalists. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, so that's the background on um, the actual experiment and a little bit of uh, you know the data that already exists. Um, and so our task in, in starting to tackle this was to figure out um, how to actually build uh, an analysis pipeline um, to properly set uh, constraints on on the axion parameter space. Um, and there's actually a lot of really interesting, um, cool effects that, that come into play here. Um, like I hadn't really thought about much of this before this project, but I, I found it, it's been really fascinating um, to think about. Um, so hopefully I can convey that in um, this next section of, uh, of the talk. Um, so before I um, jump into that, um, let me, I, I do need to explain one thing, which is uh, the coherence time scale, because this is going to be important um, for, for what we're about to say. Um, so we're assuming that the axion field itself, each mode of the axion field um, is coherent. So we can describe it um, as an oscillating uh, cosine here. And I'm going to use the subscript i to denote a particular axion mode. So we have um, frequency here set by mass plus uh, a term here where this is the uh, kinetic energy of the field, and then um, this phase, which is drawn from um, uniform random distribution. Um, so if I think about what this would look like, what a signal, an axion signal, will look like um, in frequency space. Uh, it depends on the dispersion, the velocity dispersion of the field. So in the case where there is no velocity dispersion, um, then the frequency of the signal is just going to be peaked at the mass of the axion. Um, however, if there is some dispersion, um, which we know is the case for dark matter in the Milky Way halo. Um, you know, that'll be a dispersion that's close to about 10 to the minus three. Um, so in this case, then oops, the frequency spectrum is going to be broadened. Um, and the spread in that spectrum is essentially set by the spread in the kinetic energy um, coming from, from this piece here in the cosine. So this coherence time is essentially the time over which the phase of the axion field remains constant and the oscillation is nicely sinusoidal. Um, and it's set by uh, roughly one over uh, this um, del 
change in fre this frequency spread in the signal. Um, and that's roughly one over the mass of the axion, its velocity, and its dispersion. Now, it just so happens that in the Milky Way halo, the average velocity for the axion field is comparable to its dispersion. So it's kind of like just one over mv squared. Um, but that's just because v is, is similar to, uh, to sigma. So for our purposes, just to give you some numbers, the coherence time um, is going to be 10 days for an axion mass that's 10 to the minus 15 electron volts um, and velocities and dispersions that are just Milky Way 10 to the minus 3 level. So we're talking about, a, you know, a, in what follows whenever I'm going to refer to a coherence time scale, like keep 10 days in your head. That's essentially the, um, the important number to, to have. Um, <clears throat> and so what happens is uh, moving forward like for, for relevance of the experiment is going to be comparing this co coherence time scale with the actual length of time that the experiment itself runs for. Um, so for example, um, micromolysis experiment runs for 40 days. Um, and so that actually has important implications for what we'd expect to happen to the axion field. So this is a, a very simple cartoon uh, illustrating these points. So what I'm showing here is the amplitude of the oscillations and the time um, that we're considering. If um, the time of the experiment is much, much smaller than the coherence time for the axion field, then every time the, the experiment takes a measurement, it essentially just probes a single amplitude of oscillation for uh, the axion. And so at each time a measurement is taken, we get the same amplitude, and that's this red line up here. If in the opposite limit, the coherence time is much, much smaller than the experimental time, then every time we take a measurement, we are essentially getting a different amplitude for the axion field. Um, so that's denoted here by these blue dots, which are just kind of like a random scatter. Uh, you know, every time I do a measurement, I'm going to get a different amplitude. And the situation that we're in um, for Mike's experiment is that the coherence time, which is roughly 10 days, is on the order of the experimental time, which is roughly 40 days. Um, and so in that regime, every time that the ex you know, experiment records, does its measurement, records its data, um, we are sampling a different amplitude and we're kind of doing a random walk through, through this space. So properly accounting for these effects is going to be really important um, in the actual likelihood analysis that we're going to do. Um, for the next few slides, however, I'm just going to make a very simple assumption um, just for illustrative, illustrative purposes. Um, and we're going to assume that we're in the long coherence time limit, so this limit here, where every time the experiment probes um, the system, it's always going to get the same amplitude. Um, it'll just make it a little bit easier to kind of highlight the important points um, that I want to make. Um, okay, so the critical element here is that when we do the measurement, we're not just probing a single mode of the axion field. So a single mode here would have um, its own phase phi i. Um, and here I'm just ignoring the one half uh, mvi squared term. Um, what the experiment is actually measuring is the superposition of all of these um, waves. Um, so we have a sum over all of the cosines, each with its own random phase. Um, using some fun central limit theorem uh, results, you can rewrite this um, as follows. Um, so you remove the sum. And in removing the sum, you've now replaced uh, with two random variables. So this phi here is a uniform uh, random number. And this alpha out here in front is a really distributed random number. So, um, the, you know, the sort of the trick here is in moving, you know, here we have a summation and we have all of these random phi's. 
Um, so we have n different uh, random phases. And in going from here to the second line here, we now just have two random numbers, um, one that's setting that phase for the total sum of the field, and another one that's setting um, the amplitude. And the uh, Rayleigh, dis the Rayleigh distribution looks like this. Um, so what the, and remember, this is essentially what the amplitude of that total superposition of the axion field looks like. So what we see here is that um, in this regime here, there is a probability that we have essentially total destructive interference um, between all of the individual axion waves and the total amplitude is suppressed versus in this limit here where um, we'd have total constructive interference and the amplitude is enhanced. And one thing you can see is actually that the expected amplitude here is actually larger than one, which is kind of a, a, a neat, neat little result. Um, just comes from this Rayleigh distribution. Um, so the fact that now we're thinking about this as a sum of many, many waves um, gives us the spread of possibilities where we could have total destructive, total constructive interference or anything in between. Um, this has important ramifications for how we then end up thinking about an experiment's sensitivity to that axion field, because we need to account for the fact that um, we don't really know whether or not we're gonna, you know, the level of constructive or destructive interference that has actually occurred. Um, and uh, so let's consider the case where we have an experiment that's sensitive to um, the axion field itself. So sensitive to coupling oops, G times um, A of T. And um, in this case, um, let's call G determinant here, the uh, limit that we would set if the axion field was purely deterministic. Um, <clears throat> So back of the envelope, um, this G deterministic is not the correct limit um, if we're properly accounting for the, the stochastic behavior of the axion field. Um, and in particular, what the limit we would set in that case should really be the true limit on G times this Rayleigh distributed amplitude alpha. So the true limit G would then be um, G determinant over alpha. Um, so pictorially, uh, it looks like uh, this diagram here, um, where the curve is essentially showing you the range of possible values for that coupling, um, G. Um, and it encompasses the possibility here, where um, you have the amplitude is, the axion amplitude would be enhanced. Um, so that would correspond to the case where you have total constructive interference. And so if that was happening in your experiment, then you would actually set a bound that's too tight um, relative to the deterministic bound. Um, and then up here, this is the situation where you'd have um, the amplitude being suppressed and <clears throat> the uh, limit that you would set would then be um, too uh, weak relative to what you would get rel relative to the deterministic limit. Um, and so the fact that you have this long tail here is essentially coming from this Rayleigh distribution. Um, and uh, the 95% confidence limit that you would set uh, when properly accounting for this stochastic behavior is essentially weaker um, than what you would get if you treated the axion field as being deterministic. So a stochastic axion field um, would correspond to having a weaker limit than what you would expect to get if you were treating the axion as being deterministic. <clears throat> so um, what we want to do now is to generalize this argument to the case where we have um, uh, an experiment that is sensitive to the gradient of the axion field. Um, and so in this case, um, uh, we should think of this as, uh, you know, our experiment is measuring a gradient of the axion field dotted into um, some measurement axis. So in this 
diagram up here, um, I'm showing the measurement axis of the experiment. Um, and, uh, and then this is the direction, like the velocity of the axion field that's coming in. And what's actually being, like the signal that's recorded by the experiment is going to be um, proportional to this dot product as I've written it. Um, and now what happens in this case is that the, um, this is much more complicated, like to figure out um, how the limit is effective in this case, um, relative to what I just uh, showed you earlier. Um, and that's coming from the fact that uh, the signal here, um, essentially uh, the gradient of A depends on its velocity. And also the measurement axis of your experiment is probing that velocity um, in, all, in all directions. So that's something that all needs to be properly accounted for. Um, in the limit, um, in this long coherence time limit, um, I'll just write down for you uh, what, what you get. Um, your signal in this case uh, will have the sum of three pieces. Um, each one will have its own set of random variables. So we have a term that's coming from the contribution of velocities along the z direction. Um, so it has its own amplitude that's set by a Rayleigh variable alpha z, um, and then cosine plus its own random phase phi z. Um, and then we have the same thing for the other two directions. So rho sigma squared, um, it has its own random variable um, alpha x, also Rayleigh distributed, its own phase. And then the last one is just going to correspond to the piece that comes from the measurement in the y hat direction. <clears throat> so in this case here, there's these three um, Rayleigh distributed variables, and then there's three uniformly distributed um, phases. Um, so the key thing here is that um, when properly accounted for, um, you actually become less sensitive. Uh, the experiment is actually less sensitive to random fluctuations of the axion field in any particular direction. So in particular, for example, imagine that you have a low fluctuation of the axion field in the z direction here. So let's say alpha z uh, fluctuates low. Um, you could still end up getting a measurable signal in your experiment, so long as alpha x and alpha y do not also fluctuate low. So the only way in this particular case to have your signal just cancel out is if you have both alpha z, alpha x, and alpha y all fluctuate low um, simultaneously. But the probability of that happening is going to be less than the probability of having any single one fluctuate low. Um, so that's actually good news for doing um, uh, an experiment that uh, is sensitive to the gradient of the axion field, so long as that experiment is actually taking the measurement in all three uh, velocity directions. Um, if your experiment is only sensitive to one velocity direction, then you're kind of back to having the same problem um, that we discussed earlier in the case where you have an experiment that only goes as the um, uh, is measuring the scalar field A and not its gradient. Um, but if your experiment does actually have sensitivity to all these three directions, um, that's good news because if we come here and then we think about um, the how your new limit relates to what you would have gotten if you assumed that you had a deterministic field, then um, it would look something like this. Um, so your new limit G would go as the incorrect limit G deterministic over this um, weighted sum of your Rayleigh distributed amplitudes. And <clears throat> this new distri probability distribution is shown here in green. And the main result here is that actually the, um, the, the limit that you would set when properly accounting for the fluctuations in all three directions actually ends up bringing your sensitivity um, back in line and closer to what you get um, if you did uh, just the pure deterministic case. Um, however, if you did have an experiment that was not actually sensitive to all three of those directions, then this limit becomes weaker and um, you're going to do worse than you would have done in the deterministic case. So just to ask about that, um, 
even if it's only sensitive to one direction, that direction is still going to change with time as the, rota as the Earth rotates, right? So there's going to be some averaging effect from that. Like if your physical. Um, yes. So what I, what I mean, yeah. What I mean to say by sensitive to only one direction is um, uh, like you're only like you're only actually recording data, assuming that uh, your uh, your wind is coming in one direction. OK, a fixed direction, like not not sort of relative to the earth, fixed in like absolute space. Right. OK. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's just, it's an important distinction because if you go back through and you look at all the different experiments that have done this, some of them like that pertains to and some of them it doesn't, right? Um, so um, in thinking about how you, you would need to redo the limits um, from these different experiments, you have to properly take that into account because some of them might actually be weakened um, relative to the deterministic um, case and then others might not, but it just sort of depends on how, on, on the setup. Okay, thanks. Yep. Um, yes, so um, just to kind of summarize, um, I'm showing back here the plot that, that we, um, uh, we have. So our projection for where we think uh, the experimental bounds are gonna fall um, are kind of in this regime here. And this is um, the Romalis experiment. We're gonna be accounting for uh, the fluctuations in all three directions. So we don't um, expect to have a, um, a significant weakening of the limits relative to the deterministic case. Um, this is in comparison to some previous work that was done, for example, by Block et al. Um, I skipped over the slides since I was running, I'm running a little low on time, um, but they did not account for um, the stochastic behavior um, properly. And so their reanalysis of the Romalis experiment actually put the limits further up here. Um, and the reason that their limits were weaker was because they weren't actually taking advantage of the fact that um, uh, the experiment is essentially probing all 3D directions and um, that is helping to compensate for the stochastic behavior of the field. So by properly accounting for that, we, we were essentially maximizing how much we think we can squeeze out of the um, experimental data in terms of sensitivity. Um, okay, so I only have a couple slides left, and this is mainly just to kind of um, give you a flavor for what the data is going to look like um, and uh, how the analysis is going to proceed. Um, hopefully, in the previous two sections, you've kind of gotten a flavor for how the experiment um, is set up um, or was set up, I guess, and the kind of data we're going to uh, be working with. Um, and also the issues that come into play when you start thinking of the axion wave as being stochastic, as a summation of many different individual uh, waves, each with their own phases, um, and the importance of accounting for that stochasticity, because um, it can actually uh, dramatically affect whether or not um, your limit, uh, where your limit ends up lying. Um, so uh, in the, the simple example that I had worked through in the previous slides on the stochasticity of the axion waves, um, I had assumed that um, for simplicity that we were working in this um, long coherence time limit. Um, we do not make that assumption um, for the actual data analysis. Um, that's just violated by the experiment. Again, the experimental time uh, is about 40 days and the coherence time for the axion that, um, in the range that we're interested in is about 10 days. So um, the full likelihood analysis that we have set up um, properly accounts for the fact um, that uh, the coherence time is uh, it's going to end up giving you um, the fact that the coherence time is less than the time of the experiment is going to end up giving you um, important uh, uh, correlations between um, the measurement in each time bin, and um, that the likelihood analysis that we have set up uh, properly accounts for that. Um, this is what the data would look like uh, if there was an axion signal. Um, so this is just uh, the axion magnetic field here. Uh, this is the time in days going up to 40 days, which is the length of the experiment. This particular um, example here is for a one hertz um, axion. And there's a lot of really interesting features in this, uh, in this data. So for example, um, you see all these little individual peaks, like these ones. Um, that's coming from the daily modulation 
the fact that the uh, measurement axis of the experiment is rotating along with the rotation of the Earth. Um, so we're picking up that uh, daily modulation. Um, the other thing you kind of can see is that the, um, you have this kind of, uh, the amplitudes here are coherently walking, the sort of net amplitude here. And the overall um, variation that you're seeing in that amplitude is roughly on the coherence time scale, so roughly um, 10 days. Um, so you can kind of see like uh, there's this region here, it's kind of roughly 10 days, and it goes up, and it's each of those variations on the order of 10 days. So you see both um, the daily modulation effects and then also the fact that the amplitude is varying from uh, the coherence time scale of the, of the axion. Um, you can take a look at the same data in, in frequency space. Um, that's what it looks like. So in frequency space, you end up picking up three peaks. So one being centered at the axion mass, and then two that are centered at um, plus or minus the uh, frequency of, uh, um, of the Earth's uh, rotation. Um, and then again, there's some like neat effect in here. So this spread in like this width here, that's set by um, the coherence time of the axion, the one half mv squared. Um, and then all of these little individual spikes here are, um, are coming from the stochastic nature of the field. So um, this is just one random iteration um, for this frequency measurement. If we were to just kind of rerun this again, um, that these little peaks would end up being at a different, different locations. Um, so the fact, you know, th this is just kind of underlining the importance of properly accounting for um, the probability of getting peaks at these stochastic peaks at individual locations is kind of important. Um, it's there, it's obvious in the data, like naked eye, and you need to properly include that in the likelihood analysis um, when, um, uh, to get your final, final sensitivities. Mar Mary Angela, can I ask how you generated this mock data? Did you take it from your um, um, Rayleigh distributions and first generate the, um, uh, the mock data in the left panel? So the, so the time data, and then took the frequency analysis? Um, yeah, so I mean, well, it, um, it, it, it was my student, um, Matt, but uh, yeah, so what, what Matt did was he essentially, he has a, he's, he's written up a piece of code that essentially, um, uh, you know, sums up all of the effects of the, um, uh, sorry about that, uh, sums up all of the effects of uh, individual axion modes, and then he um, does that in the time domain, and then he does a, a Fourier transforms that um, to get it into the frequency domain, which is how to get the, the right most plot. Um, he's also added in, actually on the left, he has not added in some fake white noise, but on mm -hmm. the, on the, to get the one on the right, he had also injected some white noise okay. um, into the spectral density. Mm -hmm. So all of the um, work we've been spending months on up until this point has essentially been working with all of this like fake data um, and just making sure that when we run the statistical analysis on the fake data, we end up getting results that make sense. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, at this point, we're pretty confident. Actually, just this week, Matt was starting to uh, work on the um, real data, just opening up the box on the real data. So um, I'm optimistic that we should, uh, um, we should have some final, some final results on that. Um, on the real data um, soon, because everything seems to be working well with, with the mock data. But up until now, we've just been looking at all of these, these fake signals that we've generated. OK, thank you. Yeah, um, yeah so I will, uh, let me conclude there. Um, so um, the, Hopefully, um, you know, the, the, you've taken away from this uh, the fact that uh, um, accounting for this stochastic behavior, the axion has important experimental ramifications. Um, the proper treatment of the stochastic behavior for situations where you have experiments that are sensitive to the gradient of the axion field hadn't been worked out um, completely previously. Um, and actually, there had been some disagreement in the literature as to whether or not the effects, um, how, how dramatic the effects were. Um, but uh, we've now, uh, we've sorted that out. So we have now um, a, 
clear way of, of proceeding on how to handle this um, and how to get robust bounds on uh, um, on the axions uh, in this case. And we're applying that pipeline um, now, um, possibly as we speak, depending on what Matt's doing, um, to uh, the reanalysis of the data from micromolysis co-magnetometer experiment um, that's using this uh, potassium helium co-magnetometer. So, um, the hope is that we'll be able to set uh, bounds in new regions of parameter space that are um, uh, with the projected sensitivities look like we should be able to push into regions that are um, uh, below the astrophysical bounds for axions uh, in roughly the 10, minus to 10 to the minus 15, 10 to the minus 14 EV range um, for the fermion coupling. So hopefully there will be updates on that uh, soon as we finish that analysis. Um, but until then, if there are other questions that I can answer, happy to do so. Okay, well, um, thanks very much. Uh, any other questions? Let me just stop the recording.